Welcome to the workshop, CAR T-cell therapy, the good, the bad, and the long-term. I'd like to thank Kite, a Gilead company whose support helped make this workshop possible. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Tease. Dr. Tease is an associate member at the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute and a leader in their lymphoma and autoimmune programs. He focuses on the treatment and management of aggressive lymphocytic disorders and malignancies. Dr. Tease treats patients with standard approach CAR T cell therapy, as well as CAR-based therapies on clinical trials. He favors the next phase of lymphoma care being rooted in an individualized and targeted approach and is excited about the rapid pace of development in the field. Please welcome Dr. Tease. Well, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Mike Tease, and uh, as Michelle said, I am uh, the lymphoma director at uh, Colorado Blood Cancer Institute in Denver, Colorado. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in today and uh, learning about uh, CAR T cell therapy. So, I think I did need that. Okay. So um, today I just wanted to talk about three uh, major objectives, uh, share what CAR T-cell therapy is and why it's used, explain the short-term side effects and toxicities of CAR T-cell therapy, as well as understand the longer-term side effects of CAR T-cell therapy too. To get a better picture of CAR T-cell therapy, I, I kind of want to start from the top. Uh, and I, I draw this picture out. Um, on paper to pretty much every single patient that I meet. So if any of my patients are in the audience, perhaps uh, you have a, uh, a little bit more of a head up on everybody else. But um, And this is a little bit of a biology education. Um, so everything in the blood system starts with the bone. Um, the bones hold up the body, but they also contain an environment where stem cells grow. And stem cells that live in the bone marrow are called hematopoietic stem cells. And Heme is blood, and poetic is Latin for growing, so blood growing stem cells. So hematopoiesis means blood cell growth. Um, they turn into two major types of cells, myeloid cells and lymphoid cells. And for many of you in the audience, you're probably somewhat familiar with many of the myeloid cells, uh, platelets. Um, platelets help form blood clots. Red blood cells. Red blood cells carries hemoglobin, and hemoglobin carries oxygen to your body. And then neutrophils, and neutrophils are very important to fight bacterial infections. Neutrophils work much in hand with the lymphoid cells, and there are three major types of cells. And I, I used to just say two major types of cells, but uh, NK cells are becoming a little bit more um, prevalent or prominent, I guess you could say, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but the way I describe the lymphoid cells is, is kind of like a military, um, for better or for worse. <laughs> um, T cells are the front lines of the military. Uh, they fight the bad folks by recognizing what looks like you and doesn't look like you. So if it looks like you, it's a friend. If it doesn't look like you, it's an enemy, and it, and it can kill it. Uh, the B cells are described as like the generals of the army, and they have the memory and the strategy and the understanding of what uh, what basically needs to occur. Uh, and so a good example would be is if you uh, got an infection, uh, like the flu, for example. And um, if you got sick and then you got better again, it's because the B cells eventually understand that. And then they tell the T cells, oh, I know what this is when you get re-exposed, and then you don't get sick because the body takes care of it because of that, that inherent memory that has formed. And part of how they do that is actually turning into plasma cells. And for those of you who may be on the call with the history of multiple myeloma, it is plasma cells that are is the derivation of your disease. And that actually has a lot more uh, relevance as we move forward because uh, CAR T cell therapy is being used in multiple myeloma. Now the other one at the top or the side right here is the, the, lymph, the NK cells. And those stand for natural killer cells. And it's a remnant of an archaic immune system, um, but it does have some natural infection fighting and actually some natural tumor fighting abilities. To understand you know, CAR T cell therapy, I just want to do a brief review of what the two differences between stem cell transplants, the two different types of stem cell transplants are, and how it kind of fits into CAR T cell therapy. 
So for autologous stem cell transplants, the treatment is high-dose chemotherapy. Um, the two major regimens that are used for most uh, diseases are beam or melphalan. And as you might be aware, it's not actually the stem cell transplant that's doing anything. It's really actually just bypassing the major side effect of the chemotherapy is that it eradicates all your hematopoietic stem cells. So the, for that reason, we have to collect your stem cells before, before the treatment, do the treatment, and then give you back your stem cells. So the correct term is actually high-dose chemotherapy followed by stem cell rescue. And that's really difficult to say, <laughs> too many words. So we just call it autologous stem cell transplant or stem cell transplant, which is a lot scarier of a word, but it's really the treatment, it's really the chemotherapy that's doing the job. So what if you didn't respond to chemotherapy to begin with? And for example, if you had an aggressive lymphoma like diffuse large B cell lymphoma, if you got the standard treatment CHOP, R CHOP, for example, or RICE, if you didn't respond to that, would you get a stem cell transplant? And that's a good question. It depends on the person, it depends on the patient, but the example is, is that if you don't respond to chemotherapy, you might not be a good person to get a stem cell transplant because the whole reason that we do the treatment is for that higher dose chemotherapy to try to eradicate any residual disease, or at least de decrease the burden of disease. The other type of stem cell transplant is allogeneic stem cell transplant. And the idea is that we first eradicate the immune system with what we call conditioning therapy. And it depends on the intensity of conditioning. There, there actually might be some additional anti-cancer benefit. Um, and it depends on many different factors on, on what your regimen would be and how aggressive that would be against the disease. But what we truly want is something called the graft versus malignancy effect. And that's also called the graft versus leukemia or the graft versus tumor effect. A lot of different names for the same thing. Maybe even graft versus lymphoma effect if you were a patient that got a transplant for like follicular lymphoma, for example. Essentially, you want the donor's immune system to recognize the cancer is foreign. And if you recall a couple of slides back, that's exactly what T cells do. It recognizes what looks like you and doesn't look like you. So if you are getting someone else's immune system, the idea is that perhaps it could recognize your cancer as foreign and take care of the disease. The corollary to that is graft versus host disease. That's what we don't want. And that's when the donor's immune system recognizes other aspects of your body as foreign. But the source of all that are T cells. So who gets CAR T cell therapy? Right now, there are a couple of indications um, by the FDA, and for those of you that are out of the country, um, like I'm just speaking on the, what's approved in the United States. So for refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia, this is B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and it's for patients who are not responding to therapy, it's refractory disease. And it's currently used to achieve disease control, and then for most patients, it's proceeding onto an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Other approvals are for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and that was one of the original approvals, um, and also other aggressive B cell lymphoma, so that there's some that are in the same category as that disease. And it's for patients who are refractory to two or more lines of therapy. And follicular lymphoma, after failing two or more lines of therapy, mantle cell lymphoma, after two or more lines of therapy, and then multiple myeloma, after four or more lines of therapy. And in all of these diseases, we're looking at them in other uh, settings as well. So for example, what we started investigating several years ago, diffuse large B cell lymphoma in the second line setting. And it just got approved about four weeks ago that CAR T cell therapy would be indicated for patients who have relapsed within one year of their initial therapy or that are refractory to their first line of therapy. So where's the car driving to next? Well, it, we're almost, we're very close to uh, treatment for CLL and small lymphocytic lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, and also some of the, quote, solid tumors. Um, so that's glioblastoma, hepatos, hepatocellular carcinoma, that's actually liver cancer, and prostate cancer. Uh, now the ones that we're, we're a little bit far away from, unfortunately, um, those are the myeloid diseases. So that's myelodysplastic syndrome, acute myeloid leukemia, 
uh, myelofibrosis, and some of the other solid tumors. And I'll explain a little bit more why we're kind of not there just yet for those, but we're still working. So what is it? <laughs> so uh, I told you a little bit about the T cells. They, they basically recognize what's good and what's bad. Um, but right now, uh, for, for, for pretty much all diseases, I guess you could say, um, if you don't have a T cell that can recognize the cancer, then you're in bad shape. But more importantly, it's, it's because your disease is of you. So it, your, your disease looks like you. So how do your T cells know what's good and what's bad if the cancer itself looks like you? So the idea is that let's re-engineer these T cells so they know what they need to do, which is kill the cancer. And the, the current process goes something like this. Step one is get insurance approval. <laughs> um, that's a very important aspect of it because this is a very expensive therapy. And I gave some ballpark numbers right there, um, but every program, every, unfortunately, insurance company is a little bit different on this. And also, it, 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 a lot of it depends on if you're also in, entering a clinical trial. So sometimes it's actually a little bit quicker, sometimes a little bit not as quick. Uh, but it does take some time to actually get all the pieces together to allow you to proceed to this type of treatment. Um, part of that now is also how quickly these T cells can be created. Um, for, the, for the majority of, of CAR T cell therapy recipients, this is going to be what we call a, quote, commercial product. And, com quote, commercial <laughs> means that these are pharmaceutical products. These are made at an institution, our program, excuse me, our pharmaceutical company. Um, and that process on how to manipulate these T cells is, is a process that the pharmaceutical industry has created. And, and, and it allows these cells to be made in, in under um, a controlled environment. So for that to occur, there needs to be a, a slew of, of processes to ensure that when we send these cells away, that the production is going to occur at the right time and that it's going to be received at the right time and, and are there uh, there's too many cells that can arrive all at once and can, how, can we, how can they actually manage that. So there's a lot of moving pieces to actually that first step. The next step is actually collection of the T cells and growth. The third step is the giving a low-intensity chemotherapy followed by the CAR T cell infusion. And the fourth step is monitoring for the side effects and toxicities. So this is kind of outlining the exact process of, of the collection phase, the step two, I guess you could say from the, from the slide before. And this woman was very happy, <laughs> but uh, I guess she's happy about um, the possibility of getting these T cells. But the first step is that she's going to be getting the T cells taken out, and then they get shipped away. And for many programs, it's actually done perhaps in-house, like if it's a clinical trial, so maybe we'll say it gets shipped internally, um, but sometimes it's also being shipped internationally, which depends. And then the next step is selecting the correct T cells, because I gave a very broad picture of what T cells are, but there's many different types of them. And we want to make sure that the correct ones are, are selected, because if, we, if the correct ones are not, then we might not actually do the job. The third step is transferring the genetic material to make the CAR into the T cells. And it says viral vector transfer. There's many different viruses in the world. Um, obviously, we're very familiar with that. Uh, but these are viruses that don't actually infect in a bad way. They're just transferring the DNA. And that DNA is, is going to tell the T cells to grow a certain receptor on the outside of the cell. And that's where CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. And chimeric just means it's a combination of, of molecules that um, typically wouldn't be made if the, uh, the code wasn't there. So the next step then is to expand these T cells, followed by returning back to the institution to, to then ensure that you're treating the patient. So while you're waiting for that process to occur, it, it's, there's a couple of things that might need to happen. Um, so the standard right now, it's about 14 to 22 days, we'll say, for those CAR T cells to be manufactured. 
And depending on certain clinical trials, that can actually be up to five to six weeks uh, because with newer types of, of, we'll say, products, the, the CAR-T products or CAR-NK products, which I'll get to in a little bit, there might be longer processes that need to occur. There might need to be more checks and balances to ensure that, again, it's the right cells that are being uh, manipulated, the right cells that are being expanded. Um, very, very um, complex stuff that's happening, and I I'm very much simplified it on the last slide. Uh, but for the most part, it is roughly about three weeks from the time of removing your T cells to the time that it comes back to the program for where you can get the treatment. And for many patients, especially with those with aggressive lymphomas, for example, they might need some sort of bridging therapy to keep that disease under control. And everyone's a little bit different on this one um, because you might still have an aggressive lymphoma, for example, or a multiple myeloma that um, perhaps needs, um, perhaps does not need some sort of bridging therapy, but that's a conversation with you and your treating physician on, on that you know, aspect of it. Approximately five days prior to the CAR T cell infusion, you're going to start some lower dose chemotherapy. And the reason for that is because even though these cells are, are you, they're not exactly you. Mm -hmm. And your immune system might recognize them as foreign. And so the idea is that we give two, typically it's two lower dose chemotherapeutic agents, and they're designed just to somewhat knock down the immune system in order for you to accept these cells back. And we call it lymphodepleting chemotherapy. On day zero, you get the CARs infused into you. Uh, some programs are doing this all in the inpatient setting. Some are also doing this in the outpatient setting. Um, we're, we're doing a mix of the two, and it depends on a couple of different factors. Um, well, actually, it's the next topic, which are the side effects and toxicities. Uh, but you get the cells infused, and then it's watching and waiting. And it's not exactly like a stem cell transplant where you are waiting for those stem cells to find its home, which is back into the bone marrow and start to grow and reproduce. The reproduction of these T cells actually happens relatively quickly, and it starts to expand and, and ideally starts to do its job, which is to start to kill the cancer. And with that process comes some side effects. And to be honest with you, some of these side effects can still occur even if these CAR T cells don't do what you want to do, which is to kill the cancer. So the major side effects between day 0 and 28 um, are infection, cytokine release syndrome, and neurotoxicity. And for these reasons, if you are not in a hospital setting, if you're not admitted to the hospital, you will definitely need to be close to that treatment center. On days 0 to 28, infection, I just brought that up, um, and it's primarily for a couple of different reasons. Um, the first one is lymphodepleting chemotherapy, that the two lower dose chemotherapies, it does knock down the immune system to a level where you would be what we call neutropenic, um, which is probably familiar terminology to many of, of you. Um, so you will be on some prevention antimicrobials. And um, this typically occurs between day 0 to day 14. And after the neutrophils recover, you will also be continued on an antiviral medication to help control the risk primarily of shingles. But this is the big one. Uh, this is the biggest concern um, and the biggest possibility um, for why uh, you need it to be treated at a, at a program that really knows what they're doing. <laughs> and that's if, if you... Um, are being talked about CAR T cell therapy by a provider, you're probably at a program that knows what they're doing because it's actually well controlled, um, the, the programs that um, are able to do this type of treatment. Um, but as the T cells expand in your body, they do release natural chemicals. Um, these are called cytokines. And these are the natural chemicals that the immune system uses to communicate with each other. Um, so when you get sick, if you have a fever, um, when you get sick, that's actually being driven by cytokines. It's telling the body to basically cook up, <laughs> cook, cook out these bacteria that's maybe causing you to get sick. Um, it's a natural immune phenomenon that occurs that comes from T cells. And so if you are given T cells to help fight the cancer and it starts to do its job, starts to grow and reproduce, it's going to start to throw out these natural chemicals and it's going to mimic like you're very sick. 
And there's a very wide spectrum of how ill you could pot potentially get. And so that's we call it cytokine release syndrome. Um, you could get absolutely nothing, which would be great, to it being very severe. And the three, the big three is fever, lower blood pressure, and shortness of breath. And shortness of breath comes from having fluid basically in, in the lungs and this kind of reaction that occurs. So your oxygen level could go down, you might need oxygen support. Those with a higher disease burden before CAR T cell therapy do have an increased risk of CRS. And the risk is also dependent upon the exact the product that you get. And there's a couple of reasons for that, but primarily it's because of how the CAR T cells are, are quote, built. Um, sometimes there's different genetic makeup that, well, basically uh, turns on the cells in a different way. It might turn on very quickly or it might turn on a little bit later on, but expand out in a different way. So, so long short, it's basically that um, everyone's risk cannot be clearly defined. And for that reason, we have to watch you very closely no matter what. <laughs> Uh, so, oh, I guess that's the next slide, I'm sorry. Um, but will you get it? It depends. Um, but the short answer would be probably, <laughs> yes. Um, for ALL patients, it's about 80 to 90%. Um, for diffuse RGB cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, it can range between 40 to 80%. Mantle cell lymphoma is actually up to 80%, and multiple myeloma, fairly high. Um, and but the severity might be different amongst all of that. So if I said, oh, you have an 80% of getting it, but you just might get a fever, you know, that's different than 80% of patients getting it and then even blood pressure medicines and advanced um, cardiac support, for example. But it is something to be aware of going into it. That tends to start between day three to five and lasts about five to 10 days. It's a wide variability if and when it does present, how severe it is, and how long it lasts. And the treatment is uh, a medicine called tocilizumab or comparable uh, medicines like such as one called siltuximab and steroids. It is completely reversible. Uh, but there can be secondary effects, and that's where there can be some longer-term you know, injuries that can occur. So, for example, if your blood pressure drops too low, and you can't get the oxygen and the blood and the oxygen to support your kidneys, for example, that could cause kidney injury. Steroids can increase the risk of infection. And if you're very sick and you're not able to move out of the hospital bed, you could get deconditioned and, and lose a lot of muscle mass. The, the third major side effect is neurotoxicity. Uh, you can probably guess <laughs> what that means. Um, but the, really the correct term is actually immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome. That's where ICANS comes from. But um, it's actually a, a similar process. It's driven by cytokines. And those natural chemicals that are released by those T cells can cross over the blood-brain barrier and basically jumble up the wire. That's why I describe it to patients, is that you know all the neurons in your brain that, that allow you to remember what day it is, what your children's names are, um, allow you to connect your brain, your, you know, your main computer system to your body to tell you to breathe, those can get jumbled, all those wires, um, by the cytokines. And that can make you very, very sick. It can be something from a simple, sounds simple, but just forgetfulness, um, to actually not being able to comprehend as severe as something as seizures that can actually occur. So to monitor for this, you're going to get very frequent standardized assessments. Um, it, it almost gets, uh, it's repetitive. Uh, patients um, don't get offended. It's, you know, you're just, <laughs> you're going to be asked the same questions, um, you know, what day it is. Um, can you write a sentence, sentence out? Because um, we can, if we start to notice some, some change in your, in your writing, for example, um, that could be a signal of things to come. And the idea is that we're identifying it sooner rather than later. So will you get it? It depends. It's uh, not easy to predict. But there are certain diseases that, uh, and certain treatments for those diseases that do have a higher risk, and ALL is another one. Uh, and again, mantle cell lymphoma is also higher on the list. Now for multiple myeloma, it's actually, this, I, I apologize, I didn't, this is not the, probably the correct way to put this in the slide, but there is a lower incidence of 
the standard neurotoxicity that we tend to see for other types of CAR T cell therapies. But we do see a unique type of neurotoxicity that's related to multiple myeloma CAR T. And it's, um, it's, there can be these Parkinsonian-like symptoms. Um, there's other unusual tremors and um, uh, motor neuron type issues. And it tends actually to be perhaps a little bit later than day zero through 28. And we're going to understand a little bit more about that one over time, uh, but it is something that your, uh, your CAR-T physician will probably be talking with you about. Now, neurotoxicity tends to begin around day six to nine, and it tends to last about 11 to 20 days. Um, it's a little bit shorter for those with multiple myeloma. And there's a wide variability of if and when it presents, how severe it is, and how long it lasts. And the treatment is steroids. Neurotoxicity is almost always reversible. But there can be those secondary side effects. If you're on steroids to treat anything, you can oftentimes become deconditioned. It's always important to stay as active as possible if, if it's safe. So now is a good time to talk about the financial toxicities. Um, that's a very real issue. And I, and I do need to, to bring this up um, because this can come up at the wrong time. Well, there's never a good time <laughs> to, to talk about this. But um, I kind of brought it up earlier, but the cost of the cell therapy itself is absurd. Uh, you know, it, it's absurd. I'll just say that. Um, the cost of the supportive care, also somewhat absurd. But if you think about it, you could do great you know, not have any complications whatsoever. Or you could get very, very sick and be in a critical care unit, needing to be on medicines that are helping support your heart or needing to be on a ventilator for a brief period of time, needing to be on antibiotics if you're having a fever. All of that adds up in the cost of overall care, and that makes it very difficult for, um, like, insurance companies and, and those who are covering uh, the cost of care to, to determine like what is the best price to pay. And for that reason, it does take some time before the treatment even begins for your coverage entity, we'll say, um, to agree with that program on how to cover the cost of your treatment. So more than you ever want to know, but <laughs> it does um, sometimes cause some unnecessary delay. And I'm hopeful that over time, as the treatment is becoming more and more prevalent and necessary, that this is, a less, this is less of a problem. Now, the longer term, and I guess we'll say the intermediate term, um, there is a concept of something called brain fog. Uh, this is something that I'm going to probably put in the anecdotal type realm, uh, but it's something very real, something very real that my colleagues across the country also notice. Um, and it's, events, it's getting out there a little bit. It's a little bit of a delay in that maybe neurotoxicity, all right? So uh, it's essentially, some people could put it in the realm of the chemo brain. And there's two major things of chemo brain, and I would say there's two major things that I've noticed with brain fog. It's uh, concentration and short-term memory. It's um, one of the, also the reasons why it's not advised to drive about two months after the cell infusion because your, your reaction time might be a little bit decreased. Um, it's one of the main reasons that even though people say, I feel fine, I say, you know what, maybe just take the bus. <laughs> Actually, don't take the bus. Wear a mask if you're going to take the bus. But um, <laughs> maybe find a different way to get to work, take an Uber type of thing. But in those patients um, with this brain fog, it is actually a little bit difficult to get back to work. Um, so it does resolve. I've seen it in every single one of my patients. But it's something just to be thinking of because it's not something that's very well reported. Uh, so you might, if you have the ability to maybe take some time off of work um, for a little bit longer to allow your body to heal and recover from a very serious type of treatment like this, please consider that um, if, it's, if it's available to you. Now, there is a real thing. It's, not, it, it's likely because of the cytokines that are lingering and some sort of um, disruption in, in the communication of of the neurons across the body, perhaps. But uh, something that, um, not to minimize. So the, the other late effects, um, and something that's underreported from the initial studies uh, that led to many of the CAR T cells being approved, is 
blood counts. Um, you actually can have a prolonged cytopenia, uh, basically low um, hemoglobin, low platelet count, and of course low neutrophils, uh, neutropenia. <clears throat> and this can actually last up to, I would say, about six months for some patients. And it resolves over time. You know, it, and it, and you could say that some of the bad comes with the good on this one because it is associated with patients who have persistence of their CAR T cells. And that's important for some diseases because if they're sticking around, it's probably because they have some work that they still need to do. And so um, as long as you're being supported appropriately and know that, that is gonna, that's going to resolve over time, then you should be okay. So on that note, somewhat related to this, is late effects uh, is risk of infection. So I told you about the shorter term risk of infection that's typically related to the neutropenia, the low neutrophils that fight bacterial infection, but CAR T cell therapies target, for the most part, for, I'm gonna actually I kind of do a quick lesson on this, I guess, but for the B cell lymphomas, for follicular lymphoma, for mantle cell lymphoma, for diffuse B cell lymphoma, um, for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, it's CD19. It's some, called clusters of differentiation 19. It's something on the outside of the cancer cell that's unique to that, for the most part. <laughs> uh, and that's how the, the T cell recognizes the cancer. For myeloma, it's called BCMA. Now, both of those targets are actually on healthy immune system cells, healthy B cells. So, not too much of a, of a concern if the CAR T cells attack healthy B cells for a brief period of time, but if it's persistently attacking the, the healthy B cells, you will have an effect on that memory aspect of your immune system. And that's, if you, if you recall, on one of the first couple of slides, I said that the B cells were like the generals of the army. If you knock out the generals of the army or they all quit, <laughs> then the troops don't know what to do. Uh, the rest of the crew won't know how to fight something. And that's exactly what we see. And this can be actually up to a year or so where patients who have received CAR T cell therapy have a, have a weakened immune system to the extent of that it's, it's more than likely very much similar to those who get an autologous stem cell transplant. And for those who have received an autologous stem cell transplant or, or even an allotransplant, transplant, more than likely you received post-transplant vaccinations. Um, in some programs, it starts at six months, and others it starts at one year. We, we start ours at one year. And that's just to re-educate the immune system. But what we have seen, and also um, within the era of COVID, we have been seeing that patients don't respond as well to, to the COVID vaccines after CAR T cell therapy. And that's because we're knocking down, unfortunately, the good aspect of the immune system. It will eventually come back, but it's important to know this that you do have a prolonged risk of infection. If we wanted to say that there was anything good about COVID, which is nothing, <laughs> um, you know, the, no one looks at you funny if you're wearing a mask anymore. <laughs> so uh, I, I would be advising that patients wear masks um, for at least a year after CAR T cell therapy in, in public. So, this is essentially saying the same things. I'm just going to be a little bit briefer on this one. Um, but essentially, you um, do have a risk of shingles, um, which is why the recommendation is that you would continue an antiviral therapy. Um, there's a risk of a certain type of lung, lung infection called pneumocystis pneumonia. Uh, and so you would want to be on an antibiotic for likely about 12 months after a CAR T cell therapy, three times a week. It's not too bad. And um, natural antibodies are called immunoglobulins. Um, IgG is the most common one, and that helps fight mainly sinus and pulmonary infections, so respiratory infections. In many patients, it is low for a period of time, and for this reason, IV immunoglobulin, IVIG, is oftentimes administered on a monthly to every six-week basis for some patients after the CAR T cell therapy, just to simply support the immune system and reduce the risk of viral and sinus and pulmonary infections. Now, if you had a decrease in neutrophil count, then you could also get a medicine called GCSF. Brand names are called Neupogen or Zarxia or Granix, um, but they do help support the neutrophils, and many CAR T cell patients respond beautifully to that medicine. 
Again, vaccinations would be advised. Other late effects. So there have been some rare associate, rare long-term neurologic effects. I am not entirely sure that this is um, as much as perhaps been reported. It's definitely less than 1%. Uh, and it's not clear if they're actually associated with the therapy or if perhaps it was associated with other therapies in the past or it was something that maybe was undiagnosed and then it's presented afterwards and saying, okay, well, maybe it was associated with CAR T-cell therapy. Now, there is some second malignancy risks, uh, and I can probably tell you that a lot of it is not necessarily directly related to CAR T-cell therapy. It's probably because many patients have re had required several lines of other therapies prior, and that addition of, of all those treatments do make patients prone to have an increased risk of skin cancers and um, an increased risk of something called myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a, a, another type of blood cancer. So there are some things in the, in the pipeline that is, is allowing us to decrease the toxicity um, and um, allowing us actually to do more treatments in the outpatient setting. Um, one example is using steroids at days zero through two after CAR T-cell therapy. It's shown to reduce the severity of cytokine release syndrome in lymphoma patients. And many clinical trials are investigating ways of, of reducing the toxicity. So the future, well, when cars fly. <laughs> um, there's different ways of, of looking at where we're going to be going into the future. There's so many different um, paths and the field is changing so quickly, but it's very exciting. Um, so one way is actually allowing, instead of having to wait three weeks perhaps for the CAR T cells to be produced, what about just um, educating your body to make the T cells themselves? And that's um, under investigation right now at several programs across the country. Um, what about using those natural killer cells, um, uh, remnants of an archaic immune system that can recognize you versus not you? Um, what about just uh, re-engineering them to recognize another aspects, another aspect of what the cancer is um, on the outside and use that kind of one-two punch effect? I mean, we're investigating that at CBCI. Um, using different, uh, different immune system cells. Um, so monocytes are one cell that turns into something called a macrophage. Um, that's one example. Um, what about using T cells or NK cells that are available and ready to go from donors? Um, that's another aspect of, of the future. And then re-engineering uh, the, the, the aspects, the drivers of the toxicity, re-engineering, taking out those, those genes, it's called um, knockout, uh, knocking out those specific genes that could actually drive uh, the toxicity. And one last thing is that um, we are actually investigating this type of treatment for the, quote, solid tumors, uh, and those are the ones that are non-blood cancers. Um, so if you have a target that's unique to, an, to a cancer, you might be able to create a CAR T cell to, to fight that. Now, there's a lot of aspects on why that is, uh, um, has some work to do um, and why we're a little bit farther behind on that, but um, we're getting there, and it's, it's quite exciting. So with that, um, I want to thank you all uh, for your time. Wow, thank you, Dr. Tease, for an excellent presentation. Very, very informative. We will now take questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And we've got a lot of questions, Dr. Tease, so I hope you're, you're ready. Um, yes. What is... What is my role as a caregiver for my husband who will go through CAR T cell therapy? What can I expect? And how does my role as a caregiver differ, differ from caring for someone during or after transplant? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, uh, you know, I would say big picture, your role would be the same as um, it would be if you had an allo or an auto transplant as you would for a CAR T um, caregiver. Um, you are the second set of eyes and ears for that patient. You are their, um, you're their lifeline. You're not, not, not 
that in that term, I guess you could say, but you are the one that will be calling or or bringing in your your loved one um, if and when he or she gets sick. Um, you are going to be educated. You should be educated on what are the signs to be looking out for. If the, if your loved one gets a fever, you're going to be calling the on call um, service, where you're going to be bringing in. You're going to follow the you're, you're going to follow to the T what you're educated because each program is a little bit different. But um, you're going to be looking out for um, for a fever, most importantly. And then I would also be saying that it's typically family members that notice the first nuances, the first signs of those neurologic changes. And when um, you know years ago, when the first patients were being treated for CAR T cell therapy. Um, it was it was quickly realized that it's almost it's almost like it's, it's exactly a good reason. It's almost like those wires just aren't connecting correctly, and your loved one might say just the wrong thing or just not act who they are for brief periods of time. And it's oftentimes the loved ones that are picking up on that even before we objectively identify that. So that is something to share when you're at the appointments or share with the care team if if your loved one's in the hospital. Um, but your your role is to be the eyes and ears when you're not in that healthcare environment, and and know what you need to do, and ask questions on if you don't know uh, how to actually reach out and um, to your care team when you're when you're not in that office or you're when you're not in the hospital. Dr. Keith, well, if it, a patient was exhibiting new signs of weakness, would that be something you'd want a caregiver to report as well? Absolutely, 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Because it, it might, it, have... it could be, you know, that could be something normal, you know, if your immune system is weaker, if, um, but it might not be. It might be a signal of something else. It could be like that their blood pressure is a little bit lower, or maybe it's a reaction to one of the medicines, but absolutely. Great response. I have multiple myeloma. What do you consider a line of therapy? Your slide said I must have a minimum of four lines of therapy before I can qualify for a CAR-T. Yeah, so... Um, that's a very good question as well. Uh, so as of right now, uh, the standard of care treatment for multiple myeloma in the United States is um, induction therapy, and it, it will say just RVD is a, is, a, is a very common one, followed by stem cell transplant, followed by maintenance therapy. Many studies look at that as kind of one, one line of therapy. Uh, so then if your disease comes back, you get another line of, let's say, daratinumab-based treatment. Um, that's a second line, and so on and so forth. But each study actually has their own unique criteria on what they determine the line of, of therapy. So, for example, if you received radiation to a lesion, for example, some studies might actually consider that a line of therapy. So um, it ends up being um, the institution that kind of determines if you meet the internal criteria, um, and then it's and then um, they decide if you're if you meet the candidacy of, of either trial or standard of care uh, multiple myeloma. When I say standard of care, I mean the quote commercial products, the ones that are already approved by the FDA. The next question is, what is meant by bridging therapy? Yeah. So, um, so good question. The bridging, there's, so when you get the T cells removed from you and, and when they move on to the production of, the, of those cells, it typically takes about three weeks uh, for that to occur. And for many diseases, uh, three weeks is a long time. Uh, and it's not the case for all cancers, but, but sometimes for, like, for example, an aggressive diffuse large B cell lymphoma, if you're not responding too well to treatment, three weeks is, is, a, is a long period of time for that, for that cancer to keep growing. And if it's, let's suppose it's, it's in a bad area of your body where, um, let's say, it's be pushing upon your kidneys. Uh, well, I don't think we can wait three weeks to see if this medicine will work or that CAR T cell therapy will work. 
So bridging therapy is done between the time of your leukapheresis or removal of your T cells and from the time it takes for it to come back in, in order for you to get the treatment for CAR T cell therapy. So it's about three weeks, um, roughly. And so you would get treated soon after your the, the cells are removed in order to try to control the disease for a period of time. Now, some programs actually do that even if your disease maybe isn't, quote, taking off or, or being that aggressive because some evidence suggests that going into CAR T cell therapy with as little disease as possible have um, better outcomes. So your your provider might, might be recommending it even if your disease isn't very um, aggressive, I guess you could say. Terrific. Our next question is, how long do people stay in remission after CAR T? Is it a cure or a temporary remission? Yeah. <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it depends. It depends. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I always tell patients I don't like to use numbers. Um, everybody likes numbers, of course, um, but you're one person, right? And and your response is either it works or it doesn't work. Um, and your your doc and your your care team would ideally have a plan of action if it doesn't work. And if it does work, then great. Um, in general, roughly speaking, for diffuse large B cell lymphoma and the um, related aggressive lymphomas is a roughly 40 to 60, 40 to 50 percent um, long-term response rate. And response rate we would call perhaps a cure. Uh, and for um, for acute lymph acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that could be closer to 40 percent. Um, for uh, mantle cell lymphoma, that could be about 60 percent. Uh, for follicular lymphoma, it's looking like it's about 50 to 60 percent. Um, so it's it's tough to say. It's it, if you think about where we were, like I don't know, let's say 10 years ago. Yeah, just 10 years ago. Where we are now is is that we're using this for for many patients that don't have an option. We didn't have an option in the past, and and so where we're also going more quickly, though, is like, well, if this is a treatment that actually works for the longer term for many patients, what if we did it earlier on in their treatment? And and that's one thing that I, I showed a slide, for example, for aggressive lymphomas, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It was approved on April 1st for patients in the second-line setting if they've had a relapse within one year of their first-line therapy or didn't respond to their first-line therapy. And so in, in, many, in many patients, that's actually replacing what you would do for, you would be re actually replacing a stem cell transplant. So it's actually taking away one of the therapies that we have currently been using for a long term, for a long time that has shown benefit because perhaps CAR T cell therapy actually has additional benefit on top of that. So um, it's, we have a lot of understanding still to, to know what, um, what a complete response truly means if it's actually a cure. Um, and and we'll, we're starting to see that more with um, like what we call real-world data, following patients for the long term. This next question really aligns with what you were just talking about. Um, it, it's asking more questions about number of lines of therapy, and I'm going to assume this one is about lymphoma. It says, when you say that the treatment has been approved after two lines of therapy, can you give examples of the lines of therapy that are considered? Yeah. So, um, so for lymphoma, uh, if a patient has received their first line of therapy, we'll say it's RCHOP, and they received, they got a complete response. That's one line of therapy. If their disease comes back, then they would be getting another line of treatment. That would be a second line of therapy. If that doesn't work, they would be a candidate for CAR T cell therapy. If it did work, and they, then they moved on to a stem cell transplant, that's considered a line of therapy right there. And then if their disease comes back again, then that they're a candidate for CAR T cell therapy. So it is, it's, uh, that's the example, I guess, for aggressive lymphoma. 
for um, other types of lymphomas, such as like follicular lymphoma, for example, um, maintenance therapy would not be considered a line of treatment. So a standard induction treatment for follicular lymphoma would be benamustine or benamustine or benamustine rituximab, followed by maintenance therapy thereafter. Maintenance therapy would not be considered another line of treatment because it's basically piggybacking off the success of the first line of treatment. So it's, it depends on every single patient and their actual treatment history, and I encourage, the, I encourage you to talk to your uh, hematologist on this because they would be able to more clearly tell you kind of what lines of treatment mean and which one, what, how that applies to your, your treatment history. Excellent response. Our next question is, has CAR T cell therapy been approved for mantle cell lymphoma? And if so, what is the efficacy of the therapy on MCL? Yeah, so um, it is approved for mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, it was approved, uh, I want to say in 2020, maybe 2021, um, for patients who have failed uh, two lines of therapy. Um, so what that means is, is that um, the standard uh, treatment for multi, multi, I'm sorry, mantle cell lymphoma would be first line treatment followed by stem cell transplant, uh, followed by maintenance. That's all one treatment. And then if you received another line of treatment, such as um, a brutinib, for example, or a calibrutinib, uh, and then fail that, then you meet the candidacy for uh, CAR T cell therapy. It's being investigated actually in the second line setting too, so you would maybe not even get that second line of treatment and just maybe get CAR T cell therapy. But the response rate is fairly good. It's a roughly 60 some odd percent um, response rate, and it drops a little bit down for that long term response though. Um, so somewhere between 50 to 60 percent of patients get a long term response. If okay, I'm going to answer this next question. Um, one of the viewers asked if we could list some facilities that offer CAR T cell therapy. Um, if you go to the bmtinfonet.org site, you will be able to click on Find a Treatment tab, and it will list multiple centers that have CAR T cell therapy uh, available in your area. The next question is, how far down the road is CAR-T treatment for myelofibrosis? One to two years, five to 10 years? Is it worth waiting for to avoid massive chemo or transplant? Yeah, so myelofibrosis, um, I can tell you, is, is far down the road. Um, we don't have a, as of right now, we don't have a very um, good target. Um, that's specific to myelofibrosis. And part of the reason is for everything that's a, a myeloid disease, um, so myelofibrosis, MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome, um, acute myeloid leukemia, um, there, the issue tends to actually be far higher up towards that stem cell. And so when you get higher up, when, when, when the issues start higher up, the 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 cells, um, if you target those cells, you could actually be injuring the healthy stem cells. So we have a lot of work to do to understand what can we target that's unique to some of these cancers, um, whereas for the lymphomas and multiple myelomas, we, we already have an understanding because it's a little bit of a different mechanism and how that disease evolved to, to that point. So for myelofibrosis, unfortunately, we are a little bit behind the times and hopeful um, that we're moving in that direction. Um, but I will tell you that the time for identifying that to the time when this treatment would be available to patients, we're talking years. And many times diseases can't wait that long. And that's why, um, you know, if, if you're considering not, you know, pursuing the treatment that is advised, for example, is, is do your homework first, you know, before making that determination, get that information that you need. Um, go to clinicaltrials.gov, um, use um, other resources like Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. They have a clinical trial support center where you could um, ask to see what other clinical trials could be available and see if there's something out there that you would want to consider. But I will say, unfortunately, myelofibrosis, we don't have a good target just yet. 
The next question is, is there an age group that has the highest success rate with CAR T cell therapy? Yeah, so uh, good question. There, that's that's a tough answer. That's a tough question to answer because um, often with age, um, as patients get older, um, they often come with other conditions that have developed over time, such as heart disease or chronic kidney disease, that type of thing that still adds some additional risks to the overall treatment itself. Um, but for the most part, I will say that there isn't a, an age group that does better or worse than others. In fact, um, going back to kind of that real world data, we have not seen that. Now, um, some places might not want to treat patients maybe a little bit older um, because of the risk of that cytokine release syndrome. For example, um, if the body isn't robust enough to be able to get through that, you know, our, our goal is to not, use, is to not have the treatment um, cause any compromise to you. So um, it's, it's um, person-specific, it's patient-specific on, on the recommendation sometimes on if um, CAR T cell therapy is the best treatment strategy. Terrific. We're down to our last couple of questions. Um, our session timing is um, almost up. Which do you suggest, an allogeneic transplant or CAR-T? Which one is better for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma patients? Yeah, oh, ooh. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yeah, another tough question to answer. Uh, every, so mantle cell lymphoma, just like just like all other cancers, and I always tell patients this, is that there's no one in the world that has your cancer, even though it's the same name, uh, because your cancer came from you, of you, and it still continues to evolve over time. So, for example, patients with mantle cell lymphoma, um, sometimes there are certain mutations that um, confer a, high, a poorer risk, a higher risk. Um, I will say, though, for it, generally speaking, most patients, would, I would be advising that most patients try CAR T cell therapy first, and if that doesn't work, try to get the disease under control and then proceed to an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Now, here's a problem, though, is that CAR T cell therapy was studied and is used for patients who are refractory to treatments, meaning that the patients, you know, the, the treatments aren't working. That's why you're getting that treatment. Now, allogeneic transplant you have to proceed when you have as little disease as possible. You have to be you have to be in almost a complete response to get that. And so when you say, okay, we'll do CAR T, we'll try that first, and then we'll do allo in the future, there could be a problem with that because you might not respond to treatments after CAR T cell therapy to get you uh, to a point where an allo transplant provides the benefit. And an allo transplant, historic data does show it's just as good as um, perhaps CAR T cell therapy, but it's different patient populations that you're comparing it to. So it's a, that's a very tough question to answer, um, but I would say it's a different scenario for different patients. Um, but in general, we're all kind of thinking that we would try CAR first and then maybe an allo transplant in the future if it doesn't work. With that, understanding that could be a risk because if we can't get that disease under control, then we can't do that allo transplant uh, because that, that donor's immune system is not going to be able to recognize what's good and what's bad um, if the disease is, isn't under control first. And that's called that graft versus uh, malignancy effect. Wow. This has been an incredible uh, Q&A session and such a great presentation, Dr. Tease. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise, um, and thank you to our audience for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way. Enjoy the rest of the symposium.